Um, okay. Uh, so we um, we already have one question in the chat. Um, I wonder whether I could invite um, people to either put their hands up if they're if they're comfortable asking a question, or, you know, vocally, um, or if you want to put a question in the chat, please feel free to do that too, and I will um, I'll I'll do my best to kind of uh, manage both. But while people are perhaps thinking of things, um, I wonder whether I could uh, ask one that's already in the chat. This one was originally asked to uh, Ruth um, earlier on, um, but I wonder whether Peter might have uh, some comments on it, um, which is basically uh, whether there have been any inferences from the artwork that you've produced uh, that have scientific significance. Um, so maybe perhaps we could start with Ruth on that one, please. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, it's something we get asked a lot about if our work could potentially kind of give back to science, as it were, and have any scientific impact. And obviously, it's not something we're trying to do as artists with our work. Um, I don't think we could actually do that. We're not trained scientists in any way. And so we lack a lot of the skills and the languages. The skills and languages that we've developed are very particular to our art making. But I do think that there is something interesting that happens when we spend time in science labs and when we spend time working with scientists, because often we'll come in with a different way of looking at things. And um, we're, we're spending time in a science lab at the moment where the scientists are kind of letting us loose with their equipment and kind of we're trying out new ways of doing things you know and they're getting really excited just because they've spent 20 odd years doing their science in this very particular way and it's not something they're allowed to do or they have good reason or time to do and so we kind of throw things up in the air a bit sometimes and and so it might make them think about things slightly differently but we're also there and we we're, we're kind of there's a certain celebration about the science that they're doing when we're there. And so we get really excited. And then there's this kind of general excitement that seems to kind of happen. And of which I think is really important. There's kind of the social, so there's kind of social, a social role that we often play when we go in to these laboratories that we we give something back in that sense. Super, thank you. Um... Would you have any any comments? It's a slightly different frame that you're working in, Peter. But I wonder whether you have any comments on that as well. Um, yeah, well, I mean, we do have several collaborations going on with scientists. Um, uh, there are bioacousticians who are getting very interested in our setup mostly bioacoustics bio for the moment mostly uses recorded sound which they then take back to the lab and analyze and so on but things are moving very fast and it's really quite likely that we'd be able to analyze in real time for instance the species that are present you know uh, on a microphone and and so on but most of the time it's it's more of a question of kind of awareness and the scientists we're, we're work, working with are kind of really interested in the fact that this has this public outreach and therefore that they can get people involved um, in the ecological concerns that, they, that they're preoccupied by and uh, because we have this public outreach. And in a sense, I think, as well as Ruth, what, what we're really interested in really is changing the way that people perceive the world rather than uh, actually giving them hard data as such. Mm. Yeah. yeah, quite often. I'll just add to that as well, because quite often when we, no, sometimes when we go in and we're working with scientists, um, scientists kind of might comment that they're, they're really pleased that they're going to have something they can use to explain their science with. And we, we have to be really clear that that's not our role as artists when we go in. And in fact, I think, you know, almost every time we have, which we've done it lots, <laughs> every outcome, it, it, it does turn out to be something they can 
um, explain their science with, not because we're making it that, but maybe not in the way that they thought it would. So we're not trying to work with the with the same kind of strict language that they're working with, but it, we're doing it in a different way. So it does have that effect, but not necessarily how, how they think it might yeah. in the first place. <laughs> Super, thank you very much. Um, I think we've got a question from the uh, Cy Wait. Uh, I don't know whether you'd like to turn your microphone on, Cy. Hi. <laughs> nice to Hi. see you. Nice to see you, Pete. Hi. All right. Hi there. Um, yeah, question for Ruth. Um, I've actually got a lecture coming up on this. So I was wondering okay. if um, you're making use of uh, artificial intelligence in either the ways you're interpreting the data that you're given or whether the scientists are doing that. And does that have any impact on the way you present the work or what might it do in the future? There's a short answer. No. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I think some, I'm trying to remember now. Somebody asked us that recently about a project and we went back to the scientists. I think it was with our Spectral Constellations project when we did recently with Dundee. And um, yeah, they'd asked us anyway. We went back and they were like, no, we haven't. Um, but that we have recently this year we've been going and we've been doing a project actually kind of slightly different kind of science environment going into the UK government office for science. So it's where the science policy is happening. So it's almost like a step before where they're kind of deciding what science should actually get funded to happen in the UK, which is very interesting. So we've been looking at, at the ways that they are um the, the language and the structures and the techniques that they're using to enable them to potentially consider what the future might be like and what we might need kind of technologically or scientifically. And some of what what one of the, the topics they produced these reports and one of the reports they were producing when we were there was the AI report. And so it's basically them deciding. So we, we've, start, we've started to kind of play around with AI because we were working specifically with this report and so we're very at the very beginning very early stages of playing around with that so. thank you very much really useful thank you okay. um got a, another question for ruth but again this may mm. this uh, may have resonance for peter as well um you mentioned avoiding anthropomorphizing the data mm. <laughs> you kind of your intervention in in the uh in you know as a I don't know as a sort of filter, yeah. Um, but artistic choice is obviously made in deciding how users experience the source data. So would you like to expand upon the tensions between fidelity to data sources and artistic and aesthetic aims? Yes, I think. Um, so yeah, what we mean when we say that is, you know, we're really interested in how the data. I didn't really talk about this in the talk. There wasn't much scope, but. Uh, how, how when the data arrives to us, so say, for example, with the CERN data that we worked with, we're really interested and we have a long history of working in this way of working with data and we call it like the raw data. So it's the data just after the instrument has captured it. So before the scientists have worked with it and processed it in a way that makes it readable to them. So quite often you'll end up a really good example is when you end up with um, say, for example, like the Hubble telescope is a good example. They would capture this data. It would be black and white, grainy images, loads of noise. It would look like, you know, really messy, noisy, black and white photography. And then by the time NASA releases that to the public, you suddenly end up with all this glossy, colorized, sort of high definition images that kind of you just think, wow, that's what space looks like. And of course, it doesn't look like that at all. It's the kind of this glamorized idea because that's what they thought at the time that the public would like that's how the public would engage with what they're doing um so we're really interested as when you strip often you go back to like the source and the raw data of, of scientific data it comes with all these artifacts and noise and it also comes like with the framing of the instrument that's captured it and we're, we're really interested in how on the one hand it makes you really aware of how that data has been captured 
and it also helps you to understand that you're you know we're positioned on this earth and we're looking out or whatever it is we're looking at there's always this kind of framing of the technology so quite often we're encouraging these kind of noise and artifacts and the the presence of the technology just to kind of remind us that we're we're humankind observing the world around us so when we say we try not to anthropomorphize the data obviously the data is being collected by humankind but we as artists we try to keep that raw format so for example like in halo the cern piece the date that's how the data exists already it exists as these points um in space and we it, it, yet again that was in a, a very specific format so we have we worked very closely with two a scientist and then a programmer to maintain those points in space exactly where they were because for us we want the data to speak for itself so in the same way when we work with the seismic data we don't want to then assign those numbers to say particular instruments or particular, say, Western harmonic scales or something for it to play that sound. We want it to be its raw self because we, we're we interested in, in how we experience things and what, what that matter says to us. So we kind of want this direct relationship rather than kind of glossing it up. But we recognise that obviously, you know, as hard as we try, there is probably still something in there. But that's our intention. That's great. Um, I have a follow-up question to that, but I was just going to ask first whether Peter had any any thoughts about the. Uh, I guess your 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 artistic decision making in terms of the materials that you choose and how those are presented and um, the implications of that. Well, <clears throat> yeah, actually, I I noted down the same question for Ruth <laughs> <laughs> because I've done a lot of data sonification myself. And um, and it's I I think it's almost impossible not to anthrop anthropomorphize the data because by definition it's we are effectively gathering it. But it was a very good answer I think that you gave. Um, <laughs> I get away with but, that? <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean it's it's always a problem, and it's so it's it's the whole the whole question for me in that kind of work is is the the, the relationship that's established between the data that's being collected what it's being collected from how it's being collected and then what you actually how you interpret it because you always interpret it i mean there's no doubt about that um so and and it's the 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 justness of that relationship of those elements that that makes the artwork to my to my mind but uh um it's a very tricky question and some people make the most horrendous <laughs> sonifications which i won't i won't mention <laughs> any names but um yeah um i guess no for, for us it's it's kind of it's a little bit different in the sense that um the the idea is that well it's um <clears throat> we're providing this kind of channel for the raw data so it's an unfinished artwork anyway you know so anyone does what they want with it we we do make quite an effort to uh use binaural microphones for instance because it's so great to be able to put on a pair of headphones and be transported to where that microphone is especially when it's somewhere where you can't go there so the the that photo which i showed at the end that's the sound that you have of the gulls talking to you in that microphone as if they were really literally just next to your ears is something you can never hear um uh without that 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 interface you know so yeah, brilliant thank you um yeah, I think I can't see any more questions, so I'm going to be thoroughly self-indulgent and, and, and ask mine, um, which is you both mentioned uh, space, spatial uh, aspects that are kind of part of the gathering of data. Um, so obviously, if it's you know gathering soundscapes from different regions, they're geographically separated, and in much of the data that you're capturing, Ruth, it's it's from you know kind of spatial. Uh, 
sources or um, sources collected spatially. But I was just wondering about the presentation of those in a spatial way. Um, so Ruth, you mentioned your, one of the pieces was a, was a spatial audio piece, but I wonder mm -hmm. whether that was sonified, kind of, it was sonified spatially. And then for Peter, you talked about the split sound where you're kind of gathering from spatially disjunct places and then putting those together. Um, and I wondered, again, if, sort of about the implications of that or whether you've explored that or whether that reveals anything in particular in um, the sort of spatial presentation of those things. Um, yeah, so I'm just having a think yeah. about different works <laughs> and how we've worked with them. So for, with Earthworks, which was the, the long screen with the seismic data, some of the data... We, so that was um, a four channel audio work. Well, actually we had it as surround sound and then we had these big subwoofers. So most of the spaces we've shown it in, we've been really lucky and we've been able to have these big subwoofers. So you actually feel the sound, you feel the bass as well. So that kind of physicality is really important about the work. And some of the data we worked with had been collected spatially already. So for example, there was this amazing project that we worked with um, a big glacier and the the seismometers were actually spaced throughout the glacier. So we had like multi channels of data to work with already. Um, and similarly with um, some of the volcano seismic data, there was an ex it was an experiment for the scientists that they thought, well, what happens if we collect the, the seismic data kind of on multi channels? So sometimes the data is already coming like that. Um, and obviously with something like Halo, we're creating this physical space already. And then the sound is mostly mechanical in that. So you're surrounded by the sound, um, but you can be within the sound or outside of the sound on that. You can be around the outside or you can be surrounded. So they're quite two quite different experiences. Um, but is the question just thinking well, I just wonder whether the sound thinking spatially? About it or also what it might reveal. Uh, um, might reveal. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think our considerations are mostly when we're working in that way and to scale with sound in that way is that it's this immersive environment that you're in. We're kind of replicating an environment that you might be in in the natural world, but with um, with different soundscapes. And so it's trying to be all immersive, I guess. That's our intention with those those pieces. Thank you. And, and Peter, if you have a... Yeah, well, um, there, there are many, many, many different experiments, really, which have been done with these, with these sound sources, which vary between, uh, for instance, Brussels... Uh, um, train station where we set up uh, parabolic loudspeakers which play sounds and you walk underneath the loudspeakers and and so you kind of cross the world of soundscapes as you cross the, the station and so the, the kind of metaphorical sound spaces like this um all sorts of other interfaces where you maybe slide a um uh, a tuner along a wire and move through different sound spaces and this crosses a, a, a whole building uh, uh, so the the uh, other other things which use spatialized sound to recreate totally fictitious remixed um, environments from the real sounds in real time it's it really i mean it's part of the experimentation that we we do and, and and it's difficult to go through all the examples which have which have been uh um experimented over the years but also i mean a, a, another thing which I, personally i find very exciting is the fact that now you can get these on a mobile phone in you know pretty much anywhere because you've got a good connection and the uh uh, and so listening to one thing somewhere else, uh, or even just like having a small 
speaker with something which means that the sounds mix together with where you are and where they're coming from somewhere else. I actually find that very exciting as a spatialized sound experiment. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Anna. <laughs> yeah, Hera, but yeah, do we have time for, for another question? Uh, I guess if it's a quick one. Yeah, okay, it's a quick one then. Yeah, so I was wondering, following in up also from, from these responses about, you both talk about long-term development of the pieces and long-term observation, but also ephemerality with the artwork. So I just wonder how do you negotiate both in a way like, you know, this made of, of time to develop and thing and then, yeah, this short, short, short life, I guess, of, of the artwork. Yeah, I, I can, I can maybe start on that one because it's something which I'm quite preoccupied with. But I, I mean, I think that, you know, having been work, working with digital media since well, since forever, I guess. Well, not forever, but since digital media began, uh, it's almost uh, there's almost inevitably this question of versions, you know, and things which which evolve and uh, um, one thing takes the place of another, and it keeps going. And I would never ever imagine that when we started off this project in two thousand and six that I would still be talking about it now, you know, it seemed like a uh, totally experimental, totally ephemeral. Um, and it is, I mean, it still is totally experimental and ephemeral, but that's um, the fact that it's uh, constantly being renewed is actually part of the process. And it's part of the flux, which is totally in keeping with the whole ethos of, of, of the project. Yeah. And um, yeah, I guess it's it's a complete, totally different way of thinking about art forms because there's no way of conserving it. You know, you can't um, curate it. Re well, you can curate it um, uh, um, at some point, but it's not something that you're going to be able to sell or store or, you know, all those things. In spite of people like Guggenheim trying to figure out ways of how to deal with... Uh, with, with time-based media. Um, yeah, I don't know how relevant that is for us. I feel like our work's becoming more and more material-based. <laughs> we to, seem to be always looking for the best way to store large, ridiculous artworks these days. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm, I probably can't really add anything to that, I'm afraid. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I think I think uh, that's <laughs> we've come to the end. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you very much to our to our speakers, Peter and Ruth. Those were fantastic talks, um, and uh, and thank you too for everybody who's uh, come to the meeting. Um, Anna, would you like to, to share the, share what's happening? Yeah, so next uh, seminar is going to be in, in two weeks' time. So we will announce it also, uh, but you can already have a sneak peek here. So it's going to be uh, on Wednesday, November the 1st at 3 p.m. And we will have guest lectures by Saloni Shah and Jones Bolly. So you are all welcome to join the uh, next edition and thank you very much for for uh yeah uh for being here and thank you to Ruth and Ruth and Peter big applause maybe <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. thank you for the invitation thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's been really interesting